I have vivid memories of the last thing I saw when departing from Ayodhya on December 6th, 1992. Group, you were there? Yeah, I was there. And a, a clutch of Karsevaks returning from, I mean, going away from the site and shouting, uh, Ram Lala Ham Aenge Bhavya Mandir Banayenge. To be fair, the Congress has never invested in the Ayodhya movement. If you had to describe, before we get to how India has changed, how the BJP has changed, because it has, how is the BJP changed? All the change that has come about is because of Modi. Mm -hmm. It happened in the Modi era, but it's not because of Modi. You know, I don't think that a Prime Minister can control everything that happens. Swabandas Gupta, history is an interesting thing. In 2003, you wrote uh, while writing for Rediff.com that Ayodhya was a near revolution. You also wrote, uh, Mandir vahi banayenge, these lustful chants, I'm paraphrasing, these lustful chants will not get the kind of electoral dividends that they once did. Exactly 20 years later, we are looking at the Ayodhya moment, the imminent Ayodhya moment. How would you describe it today? And when you look back at your own description of it as a near revolution, uh, would, do you think you made a mistake then? Or did something change in the interim that we haven't yet quite understood? Well, it's always um, a bit awkward to have your own words thrust back on you. But I was actually paraphrasing something which A.J.P. Taylor said about the revolutions of 1848 in uh, Germany, that it was a turning point in the history when history refused to turn. Now, in 2003, when you... Uh, so at that particular point, Bajpaiji, hmm. trying to grapple with the remnants of a Karseva, and you can remember that there was a Karseva there that, that you yes. know, uh, led to a lot of acrimony between the government and the Hindu forces. Uh, at that time, you said, well, you know, they are just walking into different directions. And what changed? were two things. First, the defeat of the BJP in the two consecutive elections, 2004-2009, the realization that you needed a different direction. Mm. And then what? one of the things which came to your rescue and pointed it was the Allahabad High Court judgment in 2010. You see, I don't think a lot of people, too many people actually believed that the judiciary would ever allow this issue to be resolved in the courts. That the judiciary would find its own way of actually prevaricating and it's a very difficult issue. It's not really a legal issue. It's it's more much more than a legal issue. Why should the judges take the onus of, uh, take the responsibility of all that? So a lot of us actually believe that it was not going to be resolved in that judicial way. And, uh, and it would and it was going to be a 100-year fight. Mm. But the argument about diminishing returns, politically speaking, yeah. is an interesting one. Because while we are heading towards a near political crescendo, some might call it the culmination of a decades-long, not just religious movement, but political movement. And it begs the question, after the Mandir, what? No, it is certainly a culmination of a lot of things. I remember the last... My, I have vivid memories of the last thing I saw when departing from Ayodhya on December 6th, 1992. You were there? Yeah, I was there. And a, a clutch of Karsevaks returning from, I mean, going away from the site and shouting, uh, Ram Lala Ham Aenge Bhavya Mandir Banayenge. So there was that sort of, a, there, there was that anticipation of a pledge redeemed. Hmm. To, to that extent, what's happening now. And uh, yes, at present, I think all of us who invested a lot emotionally in the Ayodhya movement, feeling that, you know, at least something has come about, which we never expected it to come in our lifetime. So there is that sense of fulfillment. But yes, you're right. 
what happens after that you you okay the the the, the fallout of this can happen for six months one year etc but yes there will come a time when if you if you're saying that this is a temple of modern india that this is going to actually personify something more than just religion it is actually a symbol of your national identity then what is that national identity taking us where is it take, taking us now i think this has been in the minds of the prime minister for a long time and so when he gave this call for vikshit bharat uh developed india i think what it wants is that you want to catapult india from being a pathetic third world nation with a proud civilization a long history a, something of the past to a country which has a bright future awaiting mm. so it's that sense which i think he wants to cultivate in people now how do you politically inject that message into the electorate and into electoral politics i think that's going to be the big challenge so you yes you have to get the uh, dividends of uh, ram janmabhoomi you're going to get the dividends of this ram temple but with the next step there are people uh, who vote for modi because of hindutva and there are people who vote for modi despite hindutva there are complex oh, set of factors yeah, yeah. why why narendra modi keeps winning elections but in this election given that the mandir moment is happening just a few months before the next general elections do you believe this culmination this hindutva moment this hindu resurgence hindu identity politics is the central issue or do you believe that the opposition in not attending the congress in particular in not attending uh, the, the the mandir pran pratishtha has made it in some ways the top of mind talking point no 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 it, it the ram janmabhoomi movement is going to have a deep emotional impact despite whatever the opposition did and i don't you see to be fair the congress has never invested in the ayodhya movement so i think they were six, look, looking for a convenient and expedient way out how do you get out of this it politically they, it politically makes sense to you you had no, a I you had a column you. arguing that the congress is sending two messages yeah there are two very contradictory messages this is one is that very nehruvian message which they sent which more or less is a carbon copy of the cpm message that we don't want to have anything to do with religion in public life yeah and that's one way okay it's a principle stand you may agree with it you may disagree with it but that's what but at the same time you're also sending up that we are not attending this ceremony in ayodhya because it's not strictly speaking very religious yeah it's it to doesn't make, it, yeah according to some people you know and i mean you're trying to again these very people who used to talk about syndicated hinduism and trying to codify they are the ones who are trying to do it so it's a very very contradictory uh, thing but let me let me just tell you that this election why the mandir makes a lot of sense is not because of the mandir per se but also because it comes in the backdrop of a certain sense of achievement over the past 10 years mm-hmm. i think mr modi can look back on the past 10 years and say look i have transformed india mm-hmm. now you may like the transformation you may dislike the transformation but the reality that the india of 2024 is fundamentally different from the india of 2014 is undeniable hmm. and i think it's that change if that change hadn't been there it would have been far more difficult to sell the idea of of mandir of the achievement in ayodhya now ayodhya comes in the backdrop of 370 it comes in the backdrop of a lot of achievement it comes in the backdrop of a certain purposeful governance so so in a way then the the mandir movement culminates not just the ram janm bhoomi movement it actually culminates the modi movement well, not culminates because culminates was suggest the end but it actually is a it, takes it, it, it to a peak takes it to a peak it, it crescendo is, yeah. is is the word that i that i used and that's a very interesting argument that this is almost a symbolic celebration of the decade that has been yeah it is it is a fulfillment of that decade and you see because this this is what the bjp and people like us who got attracted to to the bjp at a, at a certain point felt that we had a mission yeah yeah we wanted to change india in a particular direction we we felt there were certain reasons why india was not living up to its potential 
And Modi, I think, has addressed all those concerns. And he's taken us to a point where now he said, now we've liberated, the, we've broken the, all those shackles. Now let's move forward to an India which is which, which can actually live up to, to its potential. Okay, more on the changes in India in a moment. Let's first talk about the changes in the BJP. Someone like yourself has, has seen the BJP over the decades, right? You have been very close at one point to LK Advani, very close to Arun Jetli. You've had a very good relationship with the Prime Minister. It was on his suggestion that you actually experimented with electoral politics as well and so on. You know, uh, there are books that have been written on, on the BJP after and before Modi, authors like Vinay Sitapati and so on. If you had to describe, before we get to how India has changed, how the BJP has changed, because it has. How is the BJP changed? Oh, well, BJP has changed unreliably. I mean, BJP has moved from being a small group of very dedicated, very sincere uh, Hindu nationalists. Sometimes you could say it was like an extension counter of Nagpur. Mm. It's changed from that to becoming a mass party which incorporates a lot of very, very different impulses. And socially, I would say, the BJP has changed from being a party of, I would say, loosely speaking, the non-anglicized elite to becoming far more of a subaltern grouping. Now, it's not yet, I mean, I think that this change is still happening. It's, it's work in progress and how it's ultimately going to look, I don't know. But for example, the caricature of the BJP as the Brahmin Baniya party, which used to be there in the early, in the 80s. Now, what is it? It's an OBC party. Mm. Frankly speaking, that's what it is. The, 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 the center of an gravity. An OBC party trying to court Dalit and tribal yeah, votes. Center of gravity has shifted distinctly in favor of the subaltern grouping. So that's one social change which, which you notice. As a result of this, some of the inhibitions, which were cultural inhibitions, which were there as far as the old guard was concerned. The, you know, we may say the graciousness of Atal ji, the, the Advani ji is very uh, half anglicized, half uh, uh, Hindu uh, approach to, to this. Arun Jaitley's, you know, he, he could be in, he, he could straddle various diff different camps. That was a, another cultural formation. Now we have a far more, uh, Assertive. Someone, uh, someone once said that you know it's the, the change is there in uh, the IAS people, the old, old old type of IAS were people from uh, the college both of us attended, uh, where there was, there, there was a disproportionate number of people. The college that is just called college. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we, we need to elaborate <laughs> on that. But people who did a di disproportionate number of people who did the liberal arts and who could write great elegant essays, etc., to a generation which is now, which is full of engineers. And it's it's a big change. The mental orientation is changing. I think that also sums up the some of the changes. And yet, and yet, the the, the metaphor of the Khan market gang once invoked to reference uh, this kind of deracinated English speaking Westernized liberal without cultural roots. Today, one could argue that most of the Khan market gang has been imported into the BJP. No, as one young leader after the other leaves the Congress to join no, there are the some, other side. No, there are some who've uh, impo who've uh, imported themselves. Into into the BJP. Uh, uh, but I think... Why do you think the BJP wants them? Because the I, BJP I, has made such a big argument about dynasty. No, and yet it has taken countless political dynasty it, to it, its... It, yeah. it has. Atalji was far more receptive towards them. Advaniji was far more receptive towards them. I don't think Modi is equally as... Uh, uh, gives them the same degree of importance. Yes, some people have a certain political importance and they might be accommodated. But by and large... The Onshian regime or the Khan market gang, whichever you want to call it, Lachian's Delhi or something, or Lutian's Delhi as some people call it, uh, that is a fading. That is on the retreat. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems with the Congress is that it still epitomizes that culture. But you know, Vanity Fair, the, the, the magazine, uh, has... Uh 
a section called the old establishment and a section called the new establishment. And therefore, you're correct to say that there is that era that, you know, the door has shut on or is shutting on. But would you accept that it's been replaced by a new establishment? There's a new Khan market gang. No, it's still in the making. It hasn't yet evolved. I don't think it's fully evolved. What I think, for example, uh, many years ago, a lot of us used to say, oh, we used to lament that, oh, there are not enough right-wing people who can give intellectual heft to these arguments. And some of us used to lament that in uh, private. Now, of course, we see the mushrooming of people who, of to a different caliber, and, you know, sometimes of uh, uneven level, <laughs> levels of competence. But... Uh, but with the same, with, with, with the, with the, with the fervor that matches some very aggressively the uh, the attempts of the left to dominate the the, uh, the narrative. So it's being challenged at every point. So yes, there has been a change. So Modi has brought about a change. Not all the change that has come about is because of Modi. Mm -hmm. It happened in the Modi era. But it's not because of Modi. You know, I don't think that a prime minister can control everything that happens. And I think it's still very, very, it would be still very interesting to see what after 15 years or maybe 20 years, God knows, you know, when we finally write the history of the Modi era and we can actually uh, document the change which has happened. But I think no one will deny any, that it, we see the change happening before us, let's, physically as well as emotionally. Let's pick up just a small example that I remember of two people that you knew very well. One was a friend, Arun Jetli. Another was at one point somebody you admired greatly, LK Advani, and then became somewhat, I don't know if you would classify yourself as a critic of Advani, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. I remember being a very young reporter and getting a call from LK Advani um, in, a, in a stern but polite way saying, I saw what you reported, I saw what you wrote, I don't agree with it, but ghar pe aaye. Chai pienge, isko discuss karenge. And I went quite scared, uh, but sort of, you know, nervously holding on to my position. He was very polite. We had a very interesting conversation. And I had enormous admiration for him thereafter for actually having that argument with me. And somewhere I remember a lot of, you know, your neighborhood. You, one, one, I grew up in a refugee colony, Jankpura Extension. A lot of my neighbors were... Uh, were RSS supporters. And we would often have these very convivial arguments which would end with, Now, Jitli, in many ways, personified this kind of ability to be a consensus builder, to have friends across the aisles, to have friends in every party. Deeply, deeply, uh, sort of not just respected, but liked. Why do you think this era of the BJP doesn't believe in having that friendly argument, in building that consensus, this era of the BJP would not need in Arun Jaitley, much as the Prime Minister was actually close to Mr. Jaitley. Marka, when you look at the type of abuse which has been heaped on the BJP in the past decade, after 2014, or even Preceding, I mean, just in the run-up to 2014, Modi is a uh, polarizing candidate, he's a... Uh, uh, He's a mass murderer. He's this, that, everything. You know, you. In other words, the ground for a civilized conversation was taken away by that, hmm. and I think that affected the BJP also to a large extent. That rather than seeing them as adversaries, you know, in you know, uh, competitors, the, to a large extent, it became an, one of enmity. Hmm. That did happen. But I, you're not I, like that. I'm not. Maybe I. That, that, that depends on an individual. I'm probably much of the older school. But yes, but I did feel that that hostility, that remarkable hostility, which I witnessed during the Ayodhya years, hmm. when you lost friends, I mean, an entire tribe of friends were lost to me. Because? Because I took a particular position on the Ayodhya issue. Before or after the demolition? Oh, be, be, well before. And including the demolition. Before, and that sort of thing, where, where you would sort of think that, you know, these people, we were ostracized. 
We were made to feel that we didn't belong anywhere. So we had to fight our own battles, a lonely battle at times, especially if you belong to that minusculity of the English language elite. Uh, but we fought that battle and we fought that battle, including Narendra Modi. I know very well the amount of abuse which was uh, heaped on him. I remember one time... He, I, I noticed that he put on some weight when he was chief minister of Gujarat. So I remarked in jest, "Thoda mota ho gaye." So, "Bhai, gali kha kha ke to mota ho gaya." Itna gali, Milosevic, you know, the Balkan murderers, and everything. Everything was fair game. Look back at all of them. I mean, if you just if that period has to be documented, it's there. So, and it was also felt by a lot of people that, okay, Modi is now in power. Okay, he'll be like Bajpai. Bajpai was running a coalition government and Bajpai wanted to, chalo, sabko leke, chalo, Bajpai. You know, the genial Atalji was, that also had a role in defining policy. But then no one thought they would make 370. I certainly, just like you never believed that Ayodhya temple would come up. The day... Amit Shah went into parliament in Rajya Sabha, I remember very well. And I saw what, what he was going to propose. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, the, the sheer audacity. At one stroke, he's done what we've been wanting for such a long time, what we never thought was going to be possible. So there has been a change. And maybe in ushering that change, you have to be a little uh, strident. Mm. I'm not personally very strident, but I can understand why people are being... Even very, after a decade in power? Yes, even now, because you're, you're, because the, the obstacles, the resistance which is there is formidable. Even today? Even today. Where is, at the, every where point is, the, where saying, is this resistance? Uh, at every point you're being told that you, what you're doing is constitutionally irregular. What you're doing is you're breaking up the idea of India. What you're doing is not acceptable to anybody internationally. And there's an international elite which is also look, looking down on India and say, oh, India is, is going the way of, you know, uh, Hungary. Uh, <laughs> that's a different matter altogether. Yeah. But it's, in, India is Putin and Modi, they are exactly the same. And then some people would say, you know, no, no, it's not add North Korea to do that. So there is that entire hostility of the liberal establishment, which actually wants, which does not believe that this is the way for India to proceed. That the template which has been laid out for India is one where you plod along, where you be a little exotic in the world. And at the same time, you're somewhere in the middle ranking nations of the world. And, and uh, you know, there'll be a lot of Indians who are consequential, but India will not be the very central, important. The central point of debate, um, apart from other debates, is on the place of 200 million Indian Muslims. A lot of this debate centers around, you know, what place Hinduism, Hindu identity, Hindutva should occupy in, in, in the role of the state, in the self-image of Indians, uh, in the self-image of India as a nation. And therefore, what space does that leave for minorities, including and not only confined to, I should say, uh, the, the, the largest religious minority, which is the Muslims. Now, where do you see Modi's mind on this? Because again, this is not the Vajpayee BJP. Again, the BJP surprises. Just when you think you've understood it, a BJP leader will do something completely out of script like Advani in, in Karachi praising Jinnah. Right? You, you, like things that you don't expect happen. Uh, you don't expect the prime minister, this prime minister who once said Mia Musharraf to call Nawaz Sharif, among others, to his swearing in. You don't expect this prime minister to drop in to meet Nawaz Sharif on his birthday and so on. I could give many examples. When it comes to the question of religious minorities, especially after this big Hindu resurgent moment, and I'm not saying it's not a moment for Muslims, Iqbal and Sari, the litigant in the case is going to be attending this moment. Where do you see the BJP headed? See, the problem is that there was a time in India where it was suggested that the best way of being a Hindu is by pretending you're not a Hindu. Where you, where you are squeamish, defensive, 
and diffident about your own identity, particularly your own religious identity, with which your other cultural and national identity also flowed in. There is a very large element of what is called a religious Hindu, which comes in to the cultural uh, map, which but makes the cultural up. Hindu is As not a, not necessarily always a political Hindu. Yeah, like, like I borrow a line from Arun Jaitley. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I consider myself more of a political Hindu uh, in, in in that sense. But I do recognize that the cultural parameters of what constitutes India, the un, the cultural underpinnings of what is India, is essentially what might loosely be called Hindu, but is not exclusively so. And I think Advani ji always used to make this point that, you know, you must, it's important to take 85% of the population with you, with that otherwise you cannot go. But it's important not to leave the 15% behind. That's right. You know, so th I think what happened is that the Muslim population in India, the Muslim community in India, the leadership of the Muslim community ha had to come to terms with the fact that there was Im an Im emerging a Hindu community which was more conscious of its own role. And I think it's that transition which took a long time. For example, you had also in this period a certain, uh, a disto I would say a distortion of history which took place. And I think, you know, I, I believe that if those historians hadn't distorted history about what exactly happened in Ayodhya, the outcome might have been very, very different. Of this entire movement and moment? Yeah, I believe that that Babri shrine may not have been demolished. But you see the point, where if someone says, yes, it was demolished. Now let us talk about it. What can we do about mm. it? But it was always a question of, it was always a denial. That denial, which actually got people really worked up. Because that, the idea of that, the experience of a thousand years of, of what might loosely be called Islamic rule, like a little more complicated than that, was not always favorable to Hindu psyche in the mass psychology of Hindus. It was something which was not recognized. And it took a long time for that to happen. And I think now it's gradually getting recognized. And I believe that after the Mandir in Ayodhya and after this election is over, and I believe in this election, we will see another BJP government coming in. Mm. What extent to the quantum of majority and all that, we can talk about it later. And it will be decided nearer the event. But I think the Muslim community in India will gradually adjust to this fact. And I think that it's it will be the obligation of all Hindus, in certainly all religious Hindus, all political Hindus, to actually extend that hand there. And see, you too are a part of this country. Hmm. You too are a part of this, this country. Yes, there is a de definite Hindu ethos about this country, but you are there fully as a citizen of this country. And we are not going to hold you responsible for what Aurangzeb did. That's and you don't, as long as they are, you can't make today as long as, Muslim answerable for. And as long as, as long as certain hotheads in the Muslim community don't go up and say, we are the Ghaznis, we are the Aurangzebs, you know. They, they, but also hotheads on the Hindu right. Hotheads also. You know, who will, there is dog whistling is, politics on both look sides. Look at it. Pakistan creates Pakistan. And this is where Pakistan has also, you know, it sends up a missile named after Ghazni. You know, it. It celebrates but the iconoclasm Muslim of... But Muslim is a very, in, very interesting and different entity from Muslims anywhere yeah, in the world. Let's, let's therefore create that wall between the Pakistani and, and the Indian Muslim. Don't you think the wall already exists? No, I, I think... I think go to Pakistan God. toll line, right? A most often used against those who are seen to be no, no, pro-Muslim. No, the Pakistani... Muslim, sometimes the Pakistanis sometimes cannot understand how Indian Muslims survive. They, they are be bewildered. I've often found that. Yeah. Which there's no reason to be bewildered because Indian Muslims, some of them are doing very well, some of them are not doing very well. Because I think also one of the big problems which uh, happened in the Nehruvian era is that while a particular Muslim elite hmm. Was pandered to mm. and accommodated, and you know, given all the respect and uh, importance, a large section of the of the Muslim community remained complete underclass. Mm. 
Hmm. You know, I have documented be, I enough times. BJP's outreach with Paswanda Muslims, but I do want to ask you one more question on the the, the Muslim question for the BJP. Uh, the fact that there is no Lok Sabha Muslim member that represents the BJP. Uh, the fact that there is an experiment going on by fielding more Paswanda Muslim candidates in the UP local elections. Somewhere, the BJP is still trying to navigate this this yeah. relationship. After the Mandir. Does something change in that relationship or we don't know? No, I, you see, the point is, I mean, I, I work quite a lot in West Bengal, which has a very 30% Muslim community. Now, the point is, we're very... Where Mamta Banerjee has decided to have an all-faith rally. Yeah, we'll talk about the all-faith okay. rally later. But later. I'm talking about the Muslim community. Yeah. Now, the Muslim community in Bengal does not, uh, believes that, that it must... Gives its entire throw, throw its entire weight behind Mamta Banerjee and act as the main political as, as the mainstay of Mamta's thing. So that if thirty percent votes she gets, she needs to add ten percent Hindu votes, and she's go home, home, home and dry. Now that's one way of looking at it. So even if you put up Muslim candidates, it's not going to win. So why try? You can ask that. that. No, I think you will have to try. You will have to make that attempt. Uh, I hope. That in the coming days, the Muslim community may not necessarily attach itself to, to the BJP. They may be with, with the SP, they may be with the Congress, they may be with the communists, whatever it is. But that notion of uh, enmity of the Muslims with the BJP, I hope that... Recedes. Who is it incumbent upon to change that relationship? You seem to be putting the onus on the community. I think it's 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 a question of both, but the realization of what the new realities are from both sides. You know, Pramod Mahajan. What one, is this new reality? You know, the Pramod Mahajan once said that one of the reasons why riots in Mumbai ceased uh, was that ye kitna log ko marenge, unhone kitna marenge, ham bhi kitna marenge. I mean, it, 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 it cannot go on like that. You know? Right. Fortunately, riots have receded in this country, as you well know. Yes. That really 2002 was the last, uh, the Gujarat riots were the last really major riots. There's not anything which is good. So, the feeling of security, which you must give, you must ensure, you must give Muslims the feeling of security, in that you must give them the fact that, that their religion is not being threatened. We are not in the business of getting everyone into a garwapsi thing. Mm -hmm. That, I think, should be uh, assured. And finally, I think what has to be really thing is that at a certain measure of political representation must be found. At present, that is the problem. The real problem comes about that. You, you've, dig you've created infrastructure which the Muslims can enjoy. You've created education. You've, every, everything is there. Muslims can, theoretically, there's no barrier. The barrier lies in the fact that uh, of political... There is no policy or legal barrier uh, except one example could be offered in the love jihad ordinances that some states have invoked, uh, which I know are theoretically against forceful conversion. But there's a very easy yeah. legal counter to this, which is to strengthen the Special Marriage Act. Yes, I think so. I, I, I personally would say, say that, that, that you're absolutely right that, you know, the Special Marriage Act should be there. Yet there, there will be interfaith marriages. I mean, people will have uh, uh, relationships which are outside the community. That's right. I mean, it happens, you know, and there's nothing wrong with... Uh, the, but of course... Duplicitous behavior, craftiness, yes, all that sort yeah. of thing is there. It's a small thing and it's there and oh, I, I, I guess people will uh, uh, fight that. But yes. Uh, Personally, you're not a fan of this debate. Yeah, uh, I I, I'm not a great fan of this debate. Just like I'm not a great fan of a debate which tells people, you know, uh, vegetarianism, non-vegetarianism. You right. know, you know the food food right. debate is not something which. Is I mean, I think who you love and what you eat is is really your own business, and the state should enable. A but I can understand, you know, the impulses which have created this. I can understand. It's not that I sympathize with them, but I can understand. Okay, that's a different debate for another time, uh, which will take us in a different direction. On Mamta Banerjee, just one question on Bengal, because you know you're from there, you you fought elections there. 
Uh, this move by the West Bengal Chief Minister to hold an all faith sort of event on the day of the Mandir uh, Pran Pratishta. How do you see it? Because there's two competing political messages, not just cultural messages, not just religious messages, but also competing political messages. Mamta Banerjee is trying to send two messages, basically. One is by going to the Kali temple. Yes. She wants to send a message that Ram does not belong to Bengal. Ram is alien to Bengal and Ma Kali, Ma Durga, the Shakti tradition is all that matters in Bengal. That's the message number one. Number two, she wants to take out a rally and hold it in the heart of the Muslim ghetto in Calcutta which is Park Circus, and say, Muslims, we are with you. Mm. The point is that Mamta Banerjee has often tried to, what, what she has consistently done, and she has openly admitted that she has done it, that people can have their own faiths, but the, the, these must be, the festivals are everybody's. So what she has tried to do is underplay the solemnity of Hindu occasions mm by turning them into utsavs, turning them into sometimes jamborees. But isn't, the, the, if, that isn't is that, the Ayodhya moment a celebration for all Indians? The, in, the uh, Ayodhya is twofold. One is, there is that Pran Pratishta, which is where, where for a lot of people, it's very important because it suggests a process of recovery. I know this is a very contentious issue. What I think is that for 1,000 years, Symbolically, you're actually saying we have come back into our own. That's one. The second issue, and that, that, that combines the religious with the political. And finally, there is that at whole picture of celebration that you know a, a 30-year-old movement has suddenly come to fruition, and we've created a new tourist, uh, uh, we've created a new uh, site for religious tourism, and you know it's it, it's a great achievement, etc. etc. So there is that celebratory aspects, and uh, even during the Ram Janabhumi movement, you, the type of folk songs which used to be there, if you recall some of them, and we'll see many. Many more of those come up, and already I'm, YouTube is full of them mm. uh, about the type of thing. So there is that. But to deny the Hindus the right to celebrate this thing, I think is probably going a step too far. More the energy. She hasn't, she will never openly concede that she doesn't like the Ram Janmabhumi movement. She doesn't like the temple in Ayodhya. She's doing it by proxy in, in another way. But to posit one Hindu tradition against another, to my mind, is not a very nice thing to do. When you frame this as a 1,000 year um, issue, is there implicit in that, that therefore Indian Muslims are outsiders? Oh, why should you say that? Indian Muslims are... Everybody knows historically true that the, the um, number of outsiders is a very small percentage of the Indian Muslim community. That most of them were local converts. Yes. Their heritage is same as anyone else. But it is true that... But India, what about descendants uh, of no, those no, who came on. from outside a thousand years? That, that, that's not a very important the political thing. Is, is that there is no doubt that India suffered from political subordination right from the time of, of around the 8th century, 9th century to the time the British finally left. There was a period of subordination which we think. We are coming out of that. This marks a very important symbolic aspect of that liberation from subordination. It's not the entire thing. But it is a very important, it's an important way. When Modi ji, he says, you know, that we must move beyond, and we, if, if we were to use some of the trendy language and say post-colonialism, this is part of post-colonialism also. But Modi ji also said that his holiest book was the constitution. Ah, that's all right. To be the, you know, you know I, I, I have a little disagreement with him. The constitution is not a holy book. Constitution is not a holy book. Constitution is a man-made book. Mostly, it, it, it certainly has a certain degree, degree of sanctity. It tells you the rules of public life. Hmm. But it does not define Indian nationhood for us. But it defines a relationship. It defines a relationship between the citizen and the yes, state. Yes, yes. There, there's a certain civic relationship which is defined in the constitution. Yes. And I have no doubt about it. And that's it's very, very important. And that's where its sanctity is. Hmm. But... As I said, it is not uh, something which defines our nationhood. Those who say 
that India was born in 1950. I disagree with that. I disagree with this entire notion of constitutional patriotism, which has been imported from uh, the European Union and which has been tried to thrust, thrust into in, in India. I do not agree with that. And I think Ayodhya tells us why there is a nationhood which predates the constitution. Yeah, let's talk about a political leader from the Congress uh, who actually was quite successful at Hinduizing her politics when needed, being a nationalist when needed, merging the two when needed, but also keeping the doors and the communication open with Indian Muslims, Indira Gandhi. She is the one leader who Prime Minister Modi has been compared to again and again and again. Do you accept that parallel? That he is most similar? If you had to compare him to anybody, it would not be Vajpayee, it would be Indira. Yeah, I think there is there are similarities. What I think was Indira Gandhi was very decisive in whatever she did, right or wrong. But a lot of things she did was completely wrong, but they were very decisive, number one. Number two, she was a nationalist. Hmm. I think there, there's no doubt about it. Number three, I think she recognized, despite her immediate Nehruvian inheritance, that there is a very strong Hindu dimension of Indian nationhood, which must be upheld. She tried to do it in her own way, sometimes successfully, sometimes very cynically. But yes, so whether you compare Modi with uh, Indira Gandhi is a matter of uh, choice for any, any, anybody. But the point I think most people would uh, really uh, think is important is the de is the decisiveness factor. That's right. Yeah, that's what they, uh, they are. Also the personality-centric politics, right? To some extent, I think uh, the B. But look, look at it this way: under Atalji, who you could say was a collegiate BJP leader, mm. a BJP leader who was there right from the fifties, whose uh, uh, whose importance had been recognized and internalized by the party all through, became prime minister all through his prime ministership. There were these chutmut things. RSS saying one thing, Atalji saying something, party speaking in different voices, this, that and the other. Today, the party is hyperactive in different things. But those voices of dissent are not there. But the party, as a party, has not collapsed. Hmm. Normally, ruling parties tend to collapse a little bit. Talk about those. They're still a very formidable electoral machine, for example. But you know, when I look back at the Vajpayee years, there were any number of other BJP leaders of significance that you could actually talk about. There was this entire second generation of BJP leaders, as they were called. Three, four of them have unfortunately passed, died, no longer with us. But when you look at, for example, what happened after the assembly elections this time, uh, the complete almost irrelevance of Shivrat Singh Chauhan and Basundra Raja Sindhya, the, uh, the choosing of chief ministers whom, whom, yes, the Delhi media, before you say it, may not know by name, but surprise... No, I, mean, surprise I, I think they choices. were not very well known. Surprise choices, would you agree? Yes. Yeah, what is the message in that? Is the message that this is now a centrally run BJP? And in that, it is, is it becoming a little bit like the Congress was and the Congress is now trying to change about itself to survive? No, if you were to look at... Uh, the experiments in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan in isolation, you would certainly get that, you would certainly uh, gather that impression. But you look at the fact that there is a Himanta Bishu Sharma in Assam, there is a uh, Yogi Adityanath. Uh, Yogi Adityanath. Those are the only two I can the, think of. Two big, they're, they're big yeah. players. That in Maharashtra, even now, Fadnavis is still playing. That you're seeing the rise of powerful uh, Tamil Anamalai. leader like Anamalai. That Suhendu Adhikari in West Bengal is now mm. there. They're not sort of... So you wouldn't necessarily say that leadership, assertive leadership, regional leadership is forbidden in the BJP. That cannot be said at this point. But yes, it is true that as far as... Uh, the Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan was con were concerned. Uh, Vasundhara and Shivraj were the old established leaders and they delivered the state and you you had that change. Maybe they'll be accommodated in the centre, but I don't know. Were you surprised by those choices? Uh, personally, yes. 
I'm being very honest. I was surprised. So but what is the thing? I think there is a need for some people to actually communicate the rationale behind that choice, uh, which is not there. But you know, even at the center, if you look, you look at the Amit Shah today. As far as the party is concerned and the political decisions are concerned, Mr. Modi doesn't take most of those decisions. They actually maybe he's informed about them, but actually. On the ground, the the, the integrity is always done by Amit Shah. This takes us to the relationship today between the BJP and the RSS, which you have written extensively about and also observed. And you know, I, uh, I think I read a piece by you where uh, where you said that Advani actually told Vajpayee that when the RSS vetoed Jaswant Singh as a choice for finance minister, Vajpayee should have stood up to him. And at that time, he didn't. Later, he did. Hmm. Today, when you look at that relationship, is Modi now bigger? Is Prime Minister Modi now bigger than the RSS? And for the RSS, how do they make their adjustment? You know, there are writers like Walter Anderson who spend their life studying the RSS who say, look, Modi has is obviously delivering much of the RSS agenda through a political vehicle, but yet the RSS would be uncomfortable with the fact that there is now a personality where the personality, the, the man is the message. See, I think... It's no great open secret. It's no great secret that until the time that even when he was anointed as the prime minister designate for the BJP, the RSS had a lot of misgivings over Narendra Modi. And one of the things which uh, was always held against him at that time, and I'm not telling you who told me in very explicit terms, but was that Modi was seen as too much of an individualist. Hmm. In a, in a collective organ, organization. But Modi was also, like Bajpai, had a sense of corporate loyalty. Modi too has a very profound sense of co corporate loyalty to the RSS. And I think in every respect, he has done his utmost to promote the RSS agenda, except he does it sometimes through ways which are dif different. Like? You know, some, sometimes he uses, uh, like for instance, he, he masks the temple with saying, Sab do crore admi ko ghar mila, along with Ram. So you, you're widening the agenda. You're not making it explicitly one of them. So he always tries to find a way of actually linking it to the development process that's been his whole that, that's been his style of governance always and uh, the relationship with uh, between the rss and the bjp is always very difficult to define it's never and it's now never the same but is could, it different today than it's it, ever been right. Yeah. Is the RSS weaker today as an influence? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. It depends. Now, uh, uh, would the RSS have a veto part it, today? Uh, in certain states, in certain states, it's the political elements who are uh, dominant. In other states, it is the sum which uh, has the upper hand. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's uh, as, uh, purely as a student of politics, I would say there's no all India model. Amit Shah does not necessarily always have to consult the sum with what he does. But I think he knows, in a sense, he knows their mind. Yeah. So what they're doing is always basically in tandem. They're running in parallel, but in the same direction. And uh, as of now, but the important thing is that as of now, in nearly 10 years of the Modi government, there's been no visible example of the Sun and the BJP being at loggerheads, which was the case during Bajpayee's time. So I think that would say... But that's because there, you have a, a prime minister who's much more powerful than... That's a prime Bajpai minister who was. understands also. A prime minister who understands the dynamics. You're saying Modi is more in alignment. And also you have, you also have Mohan Bhagwat, the Sar Samchalak, who also understands Modi. And I think both of them understand each other. And I think this has helped considerably. Let's end by talking about the media. Where I must start by talking about you. Uh, before you entered politics, I, I mean, I think you're a journalist politician today, but you were a journalist who entered politics. Your college mate uh, or friend Shashi Tharoor says that you were a quote unquote flaming Trotskyite uh, before you turned right. Is that true? Well, I was certainly a 
inclined to the left and i was very anti stalinist and i had my uh, i had a certain attraction towards the more esoteric varieties of the left ideology which included uh, being a flaming trotskyist as shashi puts it what changed and when did it change i think change took place quite a lot uh, in uh, there, there's a uh, thing uh, i think i read a piece by someone who said when facts change i change hmm. yeah so i think what really changed my mind was the first the uh, collapse of the soviet union the rise of people like margaret thatcher Ronald Reagan, who I found was terribly inspirational at that point, because they were trying to do something completely new, and most important in India, a certain frustration that we are destined to become third world countries, and people were celebrating poverty for no apparent reason, and I felt that in the BJP, in the Ayodhya movement. you found an alternative way of mobilizing india and allowing india to discover its true mojo <laughs> but you were you know when as someone who identified with let's say a that you were a thatcherite would that be yes. would that be a way yes. of putting it labor responded to that i'm going away from media for a moment with coming up under blair with a third way today the opposition doesn't seem to have a third way and to be fair nor does the media the media has polarized into left and right like never before leaving some of us uh, who still believe let the facts speak in an almost you know soon to be extinct breed you know the in- interesting thing about this polarization is that the readers or the viewers love it yes <laughs> you know that yes <laughs> which is why which is why both for politicians and journalists it is so difficult to find that third way what has been called as radical centrism that is the only answer you can't answer the right with the left even though the noise on social media might tell you that it's working you know i think also in the media there there was a belief that we not only report we, we not only document we also influence we also shape modi has basically said you can document you can try and influence but you are certainly not going to shape and sometimes another factor about the media was that the media was being used by certain people within the government to stymie decision making this was happened quite a lot during the upa time when proposals or ideas which was still very much in the in, in in the drawing board stage were leaked out prematurely with the result that they ended that that that, that was the last you heard about them including good suggestions mm. modi was determined that wouldn't happen hence there is a cloak of secrecy exceptional secrecy which accompanies the yeah, decision the media maker. never knows what's Me- going to happen media does not know the process of decision making or the they know the, or the decision before it's going to happen yeah that, that's what i'm saying the process of decision making they know the decision once it's made yeah and then you can dissect it this that and the reason for it is that experience which happened during the upa regime the, but much is made of the fact that uh, and the rahul gandhi brings this up again and again that the prime minister has not had a press conference he may give interviews you know the comparison is drawn with with manmohan singh who gave many press conferences As a journalist, do you believe the prime minister should But why should address you? press conferences to communicate? Why does the prime minister give the press conference? The prime minister in the past used to give press conferences to communicate yeah. certain things. He feels there are other alternative methods of communication with the social media, with the social media, with uh, monkey getting, bath, with monkey bath, with getting other people giving interviews. Certainly, he gives interviews to one or two stations, a uh, television station. Maybe he chooses who he's going to give the interview, interview to. But the important thing for him is that he feels like communicating. He feels he doesn't have an obligation to the media. Yeah, that's the point. He doesn't feel he has an obligation. If you want communication, then let Amit Shah do it. let someone else do it 
even Amit Shah, who's very communicative with the media, yeah. hasn't had a press conference, uh, if you really look at it. But he's extremely communicative to the media. I don't think anyone will say that he doesn't. Amit Shah that has it for him. Yes, but the difference in a press conference and an interview is that you are not choosing who can ask you a question. Yeah, you can. There are differences. Some people don't want to do it. You can't force them to do is it. Is the media irrelevant today? The media shouldn't be irrelevant. But is it? Uh, media, a section of the media is making itself completely irrelevant. By? By sometimes adopting two things. One, by being too fawning in its praise of the government, which is not necessary, even if you're supportive of it. And the other one, which is critical of it. So this polarizing... And, and, and Mojo, we call it Chamcha and Morcha syndrome. I okay, would have tried me neither, but that's what it is. You either have supplicants to power or you have activists who think regime change is, the, is their way. Is their way. They, they, they want regime change. And they believe that, you know, they are uh, they are actually political players in, yeah. in the thing. Now, the problem is, as you said, the audience tends to lap up this polarization, but not necessarily respect it. Yeah. Right? And that is, I think, the death knell for media. The media is going through a profound crisis. Firstly, there are a lot of Technological, important technological changes, revenue changes, changes, yes. revenue changes which yes. you have to come to terms. Yes. Maybe this is an expression of that. This confusion could be an expression of that. I don't know exactly what it is. But people are looking for, trying to, hunting for alternative media to get news, to get information and what they want. I'm surprised and I'm struck by the number of young people who just don't read newspapers any longer. Yeah. You know, to yeah. me, it's you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's something the morning doesn't begin unless you have read. a paper in your hand. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But to a large number of people, they get their news, their information, their, their opinions, etc. From quarters which are very different. Are you distressed by the state of media? No, no, no. no, no. I'm, not, I'm not distressed. It's, it's part of the change which is happening elsewhere. Does the media, you know, reflect, does the media reflect the polarization or has it created see, it? When, or people, it? when people say that media is not free in this country, yes. I, I disagree with that totally. Because and the media is chaotic. Media is sometimes self-destructive. Yeah. But it's certainly free. I mean, it can do what it wants to. I mean, within limits, you know, there, there are obviously. And yes, there are odd aberrations here and there. You know, someone uh, attacks Bal Thakare, so they're put, put under jail. Someone writes a blog. Some, some idiotic things happen. Hmm. But that I still feel is the exception rather than in the rule. India, by and large, is still a, f we could call it a functioning anarchy, but I think it's no longer quite anarchical as it was in the thing. And that's due to the fact that there's been a certain order which has been, impo uh, which has been uh, put in place by the Modi government. And I think that is one of its greatest achievements that today we are a far more, uh, Predictable society and predictable societies are good for growth. Let's end where we started. You said India has profoundly changed in the last 10 years. My question to conclude this conversation would be, is there one change you'd like to see in India that hasn't taken place? And is there a change that's taken place that you wish hadn't? Well, I personally think that the state of education is something which needs very urgent attention. Hmm. You know, we are on the cusp of achieving economic breakthrough in different spheres. Our growth rates are quite encouraging. Uh, Indians individually are doing fantastically well all over the world and within India. But it's not backed up by a sufficiently educated workforce. So the, the average, it has come down. And I think this is something which uh, which the, the education system we need to. And I think the Modi government, in its if it comes to power in the, the next election, must devote far greater attention to uh, edu education. And I think that this is a point. Secondly, I think what is great is that India, the pride that India feels, Indians feel in India, has gone up exponentially. You know, there were uh, at the time of the um, uh, Indo-US nuclear accord. I think Condoleezza Rice said, "We are determined to make India a great power." 
<laughs> so at that time I used to comment that you know you, you can take a horse to the water but you can't make it drink. Yeah. But today I feel that the horse has started drinking and I think we are getting there and I believe I would place a lot of credit to Mr Modi for having that vision and that single mindedness of taking in there he he you know sometimes he's too much of a he 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 sort of possessed i mean man doesn't have holidays but that day he's got that single mindedness is about him but maybe it is that single mindedness what we needed at this time to take india out of that you know that mediocrity uh, 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 stagnation and take it to some place i hope he's taken us into orbit and what about a change that you wish had it taken place again it, i'm not saying the government has brought that change something has changed you know if you as you get older there are a lot of things which you can't identify with <laughs> uh cultural shifts etc which you feel shouldn't have taken place but come on people who are younger they have different tastes they have different orientation they have different uh belief structures so i mean <laughs> one of the my greatest regrets is that people don't read books anymore that's right but is that an indian phenomena i don't know but like instagram knowledge is a dangerous thing yeah, to rephrase keeps yeah exactly it is <laughs> very very dangerous stuff. but but you know that's not something which i think was because of modi because of this that but I mean, these are large, larger changes but then you sometimes wonder okay you you've got a collection of 4000 books what the hell are you going to do with that now keep adding to them so often <laughs> and write some more as well thank you so much it's been a pleasure talking to you thank, thank you for